Good morning. Today we will be talking again about pressure sensors. Uh, last week we have covered pressure sensors that uh, were used to calibrate all other instruments. So uh, those devices uh, used uh, the definition of pressure, either force on a given area or the equivalent definition with hydrostatic pressure. And we can use those devices to calibrate all other pressure gauges. Uh, on the other hand, if the sensor uh, or device is using this approach, so this definition pr principle, then it's uh, typically uh, very sensitive to external disturbances like vibrations, like changes of temperature, uh, movement, uh, and uh, it is very expensive. So it's not convenient to use such a device in an industrial application. So industrial sensors that you will find on manufacturing lines, on um, production machines, uh, they are not using this definition principle, but uh, they are using deformation of something. So uh, we are transferring the pr pressure to deformation of an element. Either it's a diaphragm, either uh, it can be a Bourdon tube. So uh, we are not using the definition of pressure, but there is definitely a relation between deformation and uh, between the pressure that we want to measure. So therefore, uh, industrial sensors are using deformation to give you information about pressure, but since they are not using the definition of pressure, uh, we cannot use them for primary calibration. So primary calibration is always done uh, following the definition of the property that you are calibrating, but there are other principles that can be used as well that do not follow this definition. Uh, this is not uh, related at all uh, with accuracy of the device. We will see that also with deformation manometers we are able to achieve very accurate results. We can have uh, pressure sensors with better accuracy than 1% quite easily. But since it's not using the definition principle, we will not use that for calibration. Uh, so the topic for today will be deformation manometers. So all sensors that you will see today uh, are used mostly in industrial applications and not in the labs. In the labs you need accuracy, you have a stable environment, you don't have vibrations, you don't have sudden changes of temperature. Uh, but industry will have all this, so we'll have to use a different approach. Uh, we will start with uh, something that's called a Bourdon element. A Bourdon element is uh, a mechanical device, it's a mechanical tube that will change its shape with pressure. So typically it looks like this, it is, this is the Bourdon element, so it is a spiral wound tube and uh, you connect the pressure inside of the tube and uh, you are watching for changes of uh, shape of this Bourdon element. Uh, in some cases it is a complete spiral, in some cases it's not an entire revolution, but uh, the principle is the same. Uh, the tube shape is uh, typically like this, so it's not circular, but it's flat. And uh, we are watching for the end of the tube and we are looking for the movement. So it's clear that when you apply internal pressure inside this Bourdon tube, it will try to straighten itself and uh, the end of the Bourdon element will move. And we will be able to sense that with uh, some mechanical transmission. So those devices, uh, they do not require any electrical power it's purely mechanical and uh, the movement of the Bourdon element is transferred directly to a scale. So those elements, those pressure gauges are good uh, if you want to remove the dependency on electrical energy. Uh, you want typically to use this as a local instrument. So you are not transmitting any information to a control system but in a pipe 
um, in a device, in a tank. You just want to watch for pressure and you want to have this information on, on the scale. Uh, the tubes are typically made from metals, since this th those devices can be used for high pressures. And uh, for lower pressures, well, relatively lower pressures, uh, the tubes are made from brass or bronze. And for high pressures, it is made from stainless steel. Uh, I will show you first the pictures. Uh, what is inside of this device. So the pressure gauges look like this. This is the, s the needle, this is the scale, and behind the scale we have this burden element, and uh, it typically looks like this. So here uh, you see this is the burden element, and this is another burden element. So this is a device uh, good for measuring pressure difference. And here on this right picture, you see a single burden element to measure just pressure. So here, this is the port where you connect the pressure. This is the burden element. And this is the mechanical system that transfers the movement to the needle. So those uh, pressure gauges can be used to measure pressure and pressure difference as well. So if you use just one burden element, you measure pressure. If you use two burden elements you can measure pressure difference and then it works that you have one port for one pressure another port for another pressure if uh, the two pressures are the same then regardless of the atmospheric pressure uh, there will be a deformation on both burden elements but it will be the same and you see that here uh, though the two ends of the burden tubes are connected together so if they are moving uh, and uh, if the pressure is the same you will not see that on the needle and then again here uh, those gears they act uh, like an amplifier which amplifies the small movement of the burden element uh, to a bit to a larger uh, deflection of the needle so that we can see that uh, here you have examples of the burden elements uh, made from steel, so this would be uh, for larger pressures. Uh, I have here some examples of those burden ele elements. So this is a pressure gauge. You see a brass burden tube inside, and here you see the transmissions, and here you see the complete device, uh, including the scale that is transparent, and you can check what's behind it. I have here also the burden tubes individually. So this is uh, from a pressure gauge for pressure difference. So you see here we have the two ports for the two pressures and uh, brass burden tubes. And then this they are connected at the end. If I apply pressure from one port, it moves. If I apply pressure from the other side, it moves as well. But if I would apply the, m the pressure from both ports, the end would not move and I will not see that on the needle. So this is the uh, burden element for differential pressure. And then here, uh, a smaller gauge also with burden tubes, uh, including the, the gears and the needle. So you can check out how this works. So those devices are used uh, mostly uh, for verification of uh, pressure in a system. Uh, they are very robust. They can work in an environment where you have vibrations, uh, where you have changes of temperature. Uh, the inside of the gauge is typically filled with glycerin, so uh, it dampens the vibrations, it lubricates the system. So those are, let's say, the better quality gauges uh, that are filled with some liquid that is assuring this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the accuracy class is not the best one. So uh, you can expect that those gauges will measure with accuracy of, uh, let's say, 1% uh, at the best. Uh, so if you want to measure very small and accurate changes of uh, pressure, then this is not a the best instrument. 
uh, and um, it also typically does not have any uh, data transmission. So you just see the pressure on the scale and you are not transferring this information anywhere else to a control system. So this is a s system used to indicate pressure where you want. Uh, I have found a very nice video how those pressure gauges are made. So uh, let's take a look on that. You, he you will see in the video the whole procedure starting from the Bourdon, Bourdon elements. Uh, then you will see the assembly testing and then finally verification and calibration applications at the end. So it's a very nice video explaining all this.
library also absorbs vibration well, which helps the indicator tool remain stable during operation. A worker completes the pressure gauge by sealing off the fill hole with a rubber plug. But of course, not all gauges are built the same way. As accurate and dependable as a Swiss watch, a trustworthy pressure gauge also has a pretty face. Okay. So Life without pressure gauges would be squeaky. That's for Bourdon elements and Bourdon tubes. Um, so uh, the other system that is used in uh, industrial sensors is uh, a diaphragm. So here uh, we are again deforming an element. This element is called a diaphragm. It looks like this. And uh, we are measuring the deformation of this diaphragm. Uh, the deformation can be measured, for example, with strain gauges. That's what you have here. So uh, in this case, the diaphragm is made from silicon and uh, the strain gauges are directly produced on the silicon. So this would be very small, it would be a chip. But uh, of course, you can also uh, equip a diaphragm-based pressure gauge with uh, strain gauges, so then it may look like this. So this is from a pressure gauge. This is the diaphragm, you apply pressure and from this side and on the other side we have here uh, the uh, strain gauges. In this case it's uh, semiconductor strain gauges. So they measure the deformation of the diaphragm from different sides and then uh, you can get a relation between the pressure that you have below the diaphragm and between the output signal. So typically, if you use strain gauges, you have a full bridge connection. So it looks like this. We have been talking about it during the lecture about pressure sensors. And then uh, you unbalance the bridge and you measure the output voltage. So there is a relation between the pressure and the output voltage. Uh, it's not linear. Uh, first of all, the dependence between the formation and pressure is not linear and uh, then uh, also the bridge connection itself is not linear. So there are no linearities and uh, we typically uh, uh, eliminate this by calibrating the, and the, the sensor and by knowing the, uh, the steady state characteristic. Uh, so this can be make made uh, in, um, say, let's say, a larger, larger pressure gauges. Uh, from a diaphragm that is from steel. Uh, it can be made for lower pressures when uh, you use different materials like rubber, for example. Uh, but it can be made also uh, from uh, silicon if you are measuring, let's say, smaller pressures. Uh, so here you see an example. Here, silicon chip. Uh, and here you have an edge cavity. The diaphragm is here and the resistors, those are the strain gauges, are on top of it. Uh, we don't have to use uh, just the strain gauges to measure the deformation of uh, a diaphragm. Uh, very common is uh, to use capacitive sensing. So uh, this is an example of a capacitive sensor for pressure. Uh, it also uses a diaphragm. So here uh, you have a diaphragm you apply pressure, this deforms the diaphragm and you see through this central rod the movement is then transferred to this set of electrodes. The left electrodes can move, the right electrodes are fixed and when I apply pressure uh, the area of the electrodes is increasing so I have a change in capacity. So this is how it's typically done in uh, industrial sensors today uh, for larger pressures. I have here several examples. Uh, first of all, this is, uh, uh, this is a very nice example of a pressure gauge based on exactly this principle. Uh, uh, you will have the chance to see it. Uh, so here, this is the diaphragm. So we apply pressure from this side. 
then this is the central rod that makes the entire assembly move so when we apply pressure and this is the set of electrodes where uh, those electrodes move to the right and uh, this is the set of fixed electrodes so you are increasing the area. Uh, the movement is very very small you may uh, try it yourself if you apply pressure from the front here you see the movement is let's say 0 0.5 millimeters and uh, then it goes to an electronic circuit through this connector uh, and this evaluates the changes of capacity. So take a look on this, it's quite interesting uh, how small changes and are available. Uh, this whole system uh, is uh, then typically mounted in uh, pressure sensors, then they look like this. So this is the sensitive part and the electronic circuit is here eventually with a display that shows you locally the, the pressure and then it, it transmits the data to uh, the control system. Uh, the diaphragm here in, in this picture it's made from stainless steel but it doesn't have to be from stainless steel it depends on uh, the met environment where you measure the pressure it can be also made from ceramics for example. So here I have some examples of uh, the diaphragms. So this is a ceramic diaphragm uh, and here on the back of it there are the strain gauges installed and through this connector it then goes to the electronic circuit. Uh, this is uh, a similar assembly. So again you can see the ceramic diaphragm from the front and uh, from this side you can see uh, where the connector would be uh, so that it will be connected to the electronic circuit and then uh, the complete device looks like this so uh, this is the diaphragm ceramics again this is the the diaphragm with the sensor and this is the electronic circuit if you look inside it was already used somewhere and this is where the electronics would be so those are uh, industrial sensors for pressure. Uh, it can be also used uh, for liquid level sensing because since uh, liquid level is one of the definition of uh, pressure those sensors can also be used for liquid level. So he here you see a similar device, a smaller port for a different application. Uh, diaphragm is around here and then the electronic circuit is there, it looks like this. So this gives you uh, typically current signal, this gives a current signal from 4 to 20 milliamperes. Um, I have here another set of uh, pressure gauges uh, that work in exactly the same way, it's just different uh, sizes. So here uh, you see a stainless steel diaphragm and uh, electronics embedded. Uh, pretty much the same thing for the other sensors as well. Different sizes of the diaphragms for different applications and different materials. I have a question. Yeah? Regarding using ceramics for the diaphragm, I feel like the stainless steel here seems more likely to move with regards to pressure because it, I feel like in the lens modules and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you always need to provide some protection against overpressure. So, uh, in case of this this pic picture, you see that uh, it's provided by this piece of material. So, if you apply too much pressure, it presses the diaphragm completely against this holder, and then it cannot damage the diaphragm. And uh, you do this in the same way with ceramics. Uh, of course, the bending is much smaller. So you need to have a smaller gap here. Uh, so we are measuring small deformations, but on the other hand, ceramics is more resilient to, let's say, acids and, and aggressive materials. It's uh, around one or two millimeters. It's one. You can disassemble one of the the gauges that it was there. I think the first diaphragm, 
and it was possible to remove it. But roughly like this. So, uh, those are the industrial sensors. Uh, the chip itself that is using the silicon uh, diaphragm typically looks like this. So here is the input port. Here uh, inside uh, you have uh, this device, so a chip with strain gauges integrated on the diaphragm from the back side. And uh, you then have uh, terminals that provide power supply and you read the output signal from it. Uh, I have one chip here as an example. Uh, this is a capacitive uh, sensor for 250 kilopascals uh, and it's a differential sensor. So you will see that it has two ports so that you can connect it to two pressures and you can measure uh, pressure difference as well. Uh, do you know where you can find those devices typically? In what uh, quite common non-industrial application you will see this, or you will probably not see it, but it's there. Some more expensive cars, they have those sensors installed in the tires and it measures the air pressure. So when uh, you don't have enough pressure, then uh, it will say you, okay, you need to stop and you need to uh, increase the pressure or they even are able to, to do it for you. So uh, it's used in the automotive industry where this is embedded in the tire and it measures the air pressure. Uh, also, uh, those sensors are used uh, for measuring altitude of an airplane, for example, because there is a direct relation between air pressure and altitude. So uh, if you measure atmospheric pressure, then it's quite easy to use this sensor and to get the, the height of w where you are uh, above, above sea level. Uh, of course, since barometric pressure is constantly changing, uh, you are typically comparing two pressures somewhere uh, with one pressure is a reference and the other pressure is uh, the, the, the pressure that you measure. So, for example, uh, here I could easily use this principle uh, to measure the height of a building if I would read the pressure at the base and the pressure at the, at the top. Uh, we in, in fact, we have, uh, we have such, such a sensor in a lab. It's really sensitive. It uses a similar chip like this, and you are easily able to see movement from the table. If you lift the sensor, you see that it gives you some change it some change and you are able to to read this so sensors like this are also used uh, to uh, measure altitude for airplanes for hobby airplanes and so on uh, i have here an example of um, a similar device it's a mechanical device based on uh, uh, the formation of an element that's inside the element looks like this and uh, if you apply the pressure on on that it expands or contracts so then it's again a, just a mechanical device does not require uh, any electrical energy and therefore it cannot fail if you lose electrical energy uh, it's quite old they say it's 1937 but uh, those devices are still used in uh, airplanes so if you look from the back it says in german that it's a uh, uh, an altitude meter from some airplane in 1937. So uh, those pressure sensors are are uh, used in industrial systems. Uh, the diaphragm is either the stainless steel or uh, ceramics with embedded sensors from the backside, or uh, it's a chip where the diaphragm is based uh, for on silicon. So here you have just some pictures uh, of the silicon diaphragm. Uh, so here you see the diameters. So uh, it can be very, very small. Uh, and uh, since uh, the pressure gauges are made from silicon, uh, they will be quite sensitive to temperature changes. And therefore, you typically measure pressure and temperature. So that's what you see here. You see a diaphragm. This one is larger 
roughly one square millimeter and this roughly the same size is a platinum temperature sensor. So it gives you pressure and temperature. Internally it needs the temperature reading for compensation of temperature changes of the strain gauges. So uh, then typically this will have a digital bus, so it will not be a single current or voltage signal. Uh, it will be typical, uh, typically a digital bus that will send you all those data, uh, like pressure, temperature. Uh, it may even read uh, liquid level if it's used as a liquid level meter. Uh, so today uh, the uh, analog signals are uh, replaced by digital buses uh, that uh, communicate more information than just the signal that you want. So here is a table comparing uh, different pressure sensors. Uh, we have just discussed some of them uh, and uh, you can see that some are good for high pressures, some are good for low pressures. So for example, uh, if you are looking on the burden element here. Uh, it's uh, good for relatively higher pressures. Uh, so uh, it's not good for small pressures, like if you are interested in measuring absolute pressure near vacuum. Uh, practically the same applies to all those, all those deformation uh, gauges like uh, diaphragm or bellows. Bellows is simply uh, a box that uh, changes its shape when you apply pressure. It's expanding or contracting. Uh, so it's a similar device to the burden element. Uh, it's also uh, very robust. It, you can see it, it's also good for similar ranges of pressure. Uh, the diaphragm uh, can measure lower pressures, so it has a wider range uh, than the, the burden element. Uh, the diaphragm uh, typically has some electrical output, so if you have a capacitive sensor um, or if you have uh, and the, the strain gauges embedded on the diaphragm, it gives you directly an electric signal. So uh, most of the industrial sensors used today, uh, they will probably use the diaphragm principle. So that's what's common today. Uh, the other sensors, you can see, for example, capacitive diaphragm, that's what I showed you. So uh, it's diaphragm plus capacitive sensing. Uh, it is good for quite large pressure ranges. Uh, one of the advantages of those pressure gauges is that you can typically change the range where it can measure. So then you configure the system to measure in this range, uh, to give you this signal and you just send this command to the gauge and then it gives you this uh, this information on, on some digital bus. Uh, on the other hand, you can see, for example, for lower pressures, which are somewhere here, uh, those principles cannot be used at all. So there are other principles, for example, the hot cathode or cold cathode methods that are good for uh, low pressures, but we will not discuss them here. We'll just focus on the larger pressures. We will not handle uh, vacuum here at all. Uh, so, uh, let me talk more about uh, how to place the sensors correctly in some application. Because as for all sensors, it's not just a question to get the correct sensor but uh, it's also a question how to install it. Uh, we have seen this for temperature sensors. It's quite uh, important to place them correctly and uh, even more important it will be for pressure gauges because if you do not pr uh, place the pressure sensor at the correct spot it will measure something, something else. So it will not measure the pressure that you want and it may cause trouble for your process. So uh, first rule of uh, sensor placement is that you should place pressure sensors as far as possible away from 
uh, all elements that change pressure in the process. Uh, this is for valves, this is for flaps, this is for bendings, uh, this, this is true for pumps, for example. So everywhere where you have um, something that will change the pressure in the application, in the pipe, in the, in the, the channel, uh, you cannot place a pressure sensor that is near this device. Well, you can do that, but uh, it will definitely not measure the pressure that you want. Because all those elements, uh, they change the pressure. So you will measure a different pressure and you will not get the correct reading. Uh, if you want to place a sensor in a pipe, you need to distinguish between uh, gases, liquids and vapors eventually. And uh, you need to distinguish between uh, clean fluids and something that's not clean, which, which may have uh, bubbles, for example, or which may have sediments. And uh, based on the properties of your fluid, you need to, to, to select the correct placement. Uh, this is a recommendation for clean gases. So for clean gases, you can see that the probe port is attached from the top. And the diameter typically is around one millimeter. And then, of course, uh, you need to connect some pipe that will go to the pressure gauge. So uh, you have an armature that is soldered, welded, glued, screwed to the top of the tube. And the armature is typically larger. And then uh, there is a pipe that goes to the pressure sensor. Uh, it's quite important that this probe is uh, far away from anything that will change the pressure. And it should be at least 10 times pipe diameter from those elements. So if there is a pipe in front of it, uh, so you have a pipe and there is a pump or there is a bending or there is a valve, then uh, this distance should be as large as possible. So at least 10 times uh, pipe diameter. Uh, we will see next week when we will be handling liquid level sensors, oh sorry, flow sensors, uh, that uh, it may be even bigger. If you have a bending and a pump, then uh, if you use this as a flow sensor, then you may end up with 60 pipe diameters in front of it. So uh, it's quite important to keep this distance because if you don't, you will measure a different pressure. Uh, there will be also uh, a recommended distance behind this pressure sensor. Uh, if we use this for flow, then we will have to typically keep at least five pipe diameters. Uh, but if you keep more, then it's even better. Uh, the port here goes to the pressure sensor. This pressure sensor can be any type that we have discussed so far. So it can be the burden element, it can be a diaphragm, it can be a capacitive diaphragm and so on. But the way how you connect it is not random. It should follow some rules as well. So the uh, connection piping uh, should have a sensor, uh, should have a diameter uh, between 6 and 10 millimeters. That's uh, what's typically used. So here uh, you have the pressure, you have the tube and the probe, and this armature connects to a piping system, and this uh, this this uh, on the right is the pressure gauge. Uh, you see here I have some walls that you need to have in the system. Uh, this wall uh, typically is either fully open or fully closed. So it's a special kind of valve. And uh, this allows you to disconnect the entire system from the, the piping if you want to remove it, clean it, check it, and so on. So if you don't have it, you cannot perform maintenance because you cannot remove the, uh, remove the pressure gauge. Uh, the other valve 
here is uh, used to remove eventual bubbles uh, that will be there. It, this can be used also, also for liquids, uh, but uh, in liquids, when uh, this is filled with liquid and this will be filled with gas, you will not get the pressure reading. So this allows you to let the air escape. And uh, if you have clean medium, you still may have some, uh, some sediments. So here, uh, this valve on the right, on the lowest spot of the assembly, uh, allows you to open it from time to time to drain the sediments and to clean all the system. So you need at least three valves here uh, to make it work properly. Uh, you can also note that there is an inclination. Uh, the valve for the air removal is on the highest spot and then there is an inclination. This is at the lowest spot and uh, the recommended inclination is uh, about 1 to 20. So if the length would be say 20 meters, you would have w 1 meter uh, height difference. So this allows you to remove air and this allows you to remove sediments. Since it's oriented in this way, the air bubbles will assemble at the highest spot and the sediments will eventually assemble at the lowest spot so you can remove both. So this applies uh, for clean mediums like clean gases or clean liquids. Uh, if you have hot vapors, then you need uh, to provide some protection for the pressure gauge for these high temperatures. Uh, we are talking about, let's say, 400 centigrades, roughly. That's what uh, are the temperatures of vapors used in power plants, for example. Uh, and you cannot uh, connect a pressure gauge directly for 400 centigrades. It would not last very long. So you need to protect uh, this pressure gauge from the hot vapors. So uh, here you have an example when there is a horizontal pipe uh, with vapor. Uh, the probe has the same diameter roughly and then there is an armature and there is a connecting, uh, connecting pipe to the pressure gauge. And uh, here you see there's an additional feature that's called a vapor condensation loop. So this is a loop of the pipe and this uh, provides larger area. The vapor will cool down here, will have decreased the temperature and then uh, eventually will also fill this with the liquid. Uh, and then here you have the piping that is going to the uh, pressure gauge. So again, here we have a valve that allows me to close it uh, and I would have a valve to uh, remove the air eventually and remove the sediments if they are available. So here, this same assembly uh, like we have here from this part to this part, it would look in a, in a similar way. So this is for a horizontal pipe. Uh, if you have a vertical pipe, uh, you have the probe in the vertical wall and here this is the vapor condensation loop. Again, this acts as a cooler, so it cools down the vapor and here the liquid will condensate and will create um, a liquid and this will, uh, this will insulate uh, the pressure system from the sensor from the high temperatures over here. Um, how about aggressive liquids and gases? So if you want to measure acids or some aggressive gases, you can do it as well. Uh, so we typically use a di either a diaphragm that will separate those two spaces or uh, we may use a separation liquid. A separation liquid uh, is a liquid that does not react and does not mix with the uh, measured fluid so it's not, for example, uh, for water it, can, it could be oil because they do not mix. And also the separation liquid needs to have uh, a different density than the measured liquid. 
So here uh, on the left picture you have an example where the measured aggressive liquid has a higher density than the separation liquid. So here you connect the measured liquid. We typically have valves so that we can remove this device. You, we can clean it, maintain it. Uh, so roughly one half of this tank is filled with the aggressive liquid that we want to measure. And uh, the other half plus the system for the sensor is uh, completely filled with the separation liquid. So for example, this could be water, this could be oil, and oil has a lower density than water, so it floats on top of it. And here, this entire system would be filled with the oil. So then, if I change pressure here, uh, it, the tr pressure is transferred to this uh, separation liquid, and it will show me the pressure changes in the, uh, in, in, in the gauge. Uh, of course, this applies only if you can maintain this condition that in during all times uh, the density of the measured liquid is higher and therefore it sits at the bottom than the separation liquid. Uh, if it's inversed, you will change the arrangement. So, uh, for example, here uh, you have the lower density aggressive liquid on top and then the higher sep density separation liquid on the bottom. You can also uh, separate this with a diaphragm, for example rubber or stainless steel, but well, this depends on the pressure. And then you have uh, two separate systems. You have a system filled completely with the, with the aggressive liquid and a system filled completely with the separation liquid. So you can also add a diaphragm here and you can ad adjust its, its uh, mechanical properties to the pressures that you are measuring. Uh, two very common separation liquids are water and air. So uh, since they are very cheap, we can use them as separation liquid. Uh, they are not aggressive to many materials. So here uh, you have two examples how this can be used in a process. So on the left picture, uh, we have water as separation liquid. So uh, we have a port for pressurized water, uh, a valve that allows me to close it, a valve in front of the pressure gauge that allows me to remove the pressure gauge, and a valve that allows me to close the system completely. And all this system is, is filled with pressurized water. You adjust the pressure in such a way that it leaks a little bit into the pipe with the measured medium. And then uh, you are sure that this is gas and this is water. Note that here, when I fill this with water and I use it to measure gas, the connection for the pipe is from the bottom because here uh, this whole system is filled with the liquid with higher density. It sits on the bottom like this and all this is filled with the gas. So even if uh, there would be some bubbles in the water, they would escape here because it's going up. Uh, of course, there is a disadvantage that the measured medium is uh, contaminated with uh, small amounts of water. So you can use this only on some processes that will allow this, that will toler tolerate uh, some added moisture, some added humidity. Uh, you can do the same thing also with, uh, with the gas. So here, this is a connector for pressurized air. This is um, a valve to close the system, to close the, the gas, to remove the pressure gauge. And all this assembly is then filled with air and uh, you typically use this uh, for liquids so this pipe is filled with liquid and know that now the pipe is going from the top so from the top we are uh, adding a small amount of air to the liquid and uh, we have separated this space this gauge uh, with the liquid from the aggressive gas that may be here. Uh, the same problem here, uh, we again 
need to make sure that the process allows us to add some small amounts of air into the process. Any questions? Yeah. So the methane uh, liquids, then do you need to keep the same state between uh, like water or atmosphere as the one in the fridge? You, yeah, yeah, there will be a, an added error that is based on the hydrostatic pressure difference. So definitely yes. So either you keep that on the same level or there is a difference in height and you need to account for that. Some more questions? Okay, no more questions. Then uh, it's time for the Moodle test today. Uh, it's a uh, bonus test nine done on lecture 10. The session is started, so you should be able to log in. Bonus test nine done on tenth lecture. Uh, we're getting near the end of the semester. I think that before Christmas we'll have just two more lectures and then one after Christmas. So are you ready? No? Okay, so I'm starting the quiz. Okay, so if you place a probe for pressure in a pipe, then you need to keep at least 10 times the distance between the probe and other elements. I say at least, because as we will see for flow sensors, it can be much higher. Okay, so here an aluminum oxide hygrometer has two electrodes. One of them is porous and one of them is non-porous. So the non-porous is aluminum, the porous one is gold. So here the correct answer is false because you need at least one electrode to be porous to allow w moisture to enter and be removed. Question three.
So one tor, which is one millimeter of mercury column, is 133 pascals. Question four. So a burden element is not that precise. The typical accuracy is higher than 1%. So it's not bad, definitely better than 0.1. So here, the correct answer is uh, false. So that's it. And see you next week.